So conservation planning, I'm going to stick with Madagascar as I mentioned. Um, this is going to be uh, basically reviewing uh, just, just a single paper, a very nice paper that came out that uh, Claire Kremen and Alison Cameron um, led a, a whole bunch of, of, of other folks involved, um, not, not including me from a co-authorship perspective, but I helped a little bit with some of the data prep. But um, uh, this is reviewing their paper. It got a, got a quite high profile paper. They got, um, it, the paper was published in, in Science, which of course is very well um, uh, renowned, and they even got this nice image of a uh, Madagascar gecko on the cover. Um, and they were tackling um, essentially a kind of um, uh, an opportunity that, that came up. And this, um, this story has changed, and we should chat with our colleague from Madagascar a little bit about how the political situation has changed since this work was done and, and, and certainly since it was initiated. But there was, a, there was a, a, a situation going back a few years where there was a real big challenge for science um, to come up with some some conservation recommendations that could have a real big impact in one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. Of course, if you think hotspots of biodiversity around the world, Madagascar is one of those that comes out in, in, in the first, um, yeah, you know, first grouping, if you like. So back in 2002, there was about 1.7 million hectares, or about 3% of the land surface of Madagascar, was assigned some sort of protected area status. Increased rapidly over a few years, up to about 6% over uh, in, in 2005. But in uh, the World Parks Congress, a huge international meeting in 2003, the then president of Madagascar put forward to the international community a commitment that um, over the over the coming years, uh, the percentage of land area in Madagascar would be increased to about 10%. Uh, within protected areas. And this is being kind of widely become known as, as the Durban Vision. This was a very big, bold commitment um, and statement that we are committed to conserving biodiversity and we're going to put in um, the, 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 the necessary institutional um, frameworks to, to actually implement um, more protected areas. Now, there are different classes of protected areas, I'm not going to try and get into that, but at least offer some protection to a much larger proportion of the landscape. Of course, as I say, the politics has um, been seriously in flux in the last few years, so um, I'm not quite sure what, 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 what the latest is, is on this. But that was that was a big challenge to those of us in, in you know, working with biogeography and conservation planning and the likes to actually say, well, well okay, we're not going to have the full story here, but what, what are the areas within Madagascar that we would recommend where are the areas that those parks or those protected areas should be placed? So we're not the full picture because of course there are many considerations that I'm not going to go into in terms of indigenous communities, in terms of politics, in terms of economics. But from our perspective, in terms of biogeography, in terms of the uh, what we know about endemism and, and diversity in Madagascar, what would be the, if you like, the best, the best um, the best use of that money or that those protected areas, how can we conserve the most species in those areas? So where geographically in the landscape should we should we put those those new protected areas? And of course there are a bunch of tools out there that, that, that could be used for this um, uh, to, to, to address this issue. So um, as I say then in particular by Alison Cameron and um, uh, Claire Cremen they spent a few years and a huge effort pulling together a, an incredible data set of, of occurrence records for um, uh, over 2,300 species. They got all the occurrence records that they could from going around museums, chatting to folks at the American Museum of Natural History to get some of the herd data to, to other folks or uh, around the world to get, to get data sets. Put that in a big database and that was a, in, in effect a huge database of occurrence records again. Kind of occurrence records that you working with this week. They then modelled those um, 2,000 or so species. They used the maximum entropy approach, again, that you've worked with this week. They used predictive variables that were related to climate, the world data set. Um, 
and uh, forest cover as well is a very key variable for including in their models. So these were models driven by climate and by forest cover. They built their models again, they evaluated the models exactly as we've talked about this week. They tested their model performance using the area under the curve um, and presented that in, in the manuscript to, to give some support that these models were predicting effectively. Now here's a key thing that I'm going to come back to. They removed the areas of overprediction. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because it's exactly the opposite to what we did in the application that I've just shown you. That's why we're kind of pairing these two case studies together. What they then did was based on the predictions from the distribution models, and I'm terming the distribution models because they, the, the explicit goal of this project was to predict distributions of species. They wanted to know whether in the landscape, based on the little information that we have about our current records, where in the landscape are these species actually geographically distributed. Because we want to draw a boundary around that and use that as, as our protected area. So they applied a um, spatial conservation planning tool, in this case zonation, a very cool software tool for um, is this, this idea of complementarity. In effect, what it's doing is selecting priority areas based on those predicted distributions. So it's saying, well, based on these predictions of individual species distributions, it's an optimization challenge, really. Which of the areas that, based, based on, say, we've got you know, an additional 4 or 5% of the landscape, which 4 or 5% of the landscape will give us the best protection of the most species. Okay, so it's an optimization problem. Which are the most important areas for conserving the most species? And they did this in a number of ways, but in effect, the bottom line was, let's take the existing protected areas, which I said were about 6%, and then let's add on the, be the next best 4%. Say the next best, let's not say that 6% were by any means the best, but that's what we've got. So it was what are, the, what are the best 4% that we should add to those areas. Alright, so coming back to this point, because this is the, the crucial point in terms of that, that, that I want to make in terms of the distribution model. Here on the left is, um, this is taken from their, their supplement, supplementary materials. Um, I'm afraid I, I, I don't remember what the, what the species was, but this is the prediction for a particular species. This is the prediction that came out of Max8, uh, so exactly the kind of models that you've seen. High predictions shown in red, lower predictions shown in yellow, and, and, and then very low predictions shown in blue. Um, you can hardly spot them, but there are some occurrence records on here, I think, that they are in, in, in white. Anyway, in fact, the occurrence records are all found around this area. Okay? They're all found in the, 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 the central and southern port portions of Madagascar. There are not any known occurrence records for this particular species from up in the north. It's not to say that they aren't necessarily there. Maybe again, if we send field crews, they might find them, but for the purposes of conservation planning, we don't want to conserve areas where we know the species doesn't occur, or at least we know, not that we know it doesn't occur, but we don't have evidence that it does occur. So, whereas for our study that I've just shown you for predicting um, areas to, 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 to look for unknown endemism, instead of picking this area out and saying, Hel hello, that's really interesting. That's the kind of distant open area of prediction that we don't know there are approach records from, but we're going to go and look. This study said, well, that area we don't want to incorporate in the conservation planning, so that's exactly the area that we're not interested in. Okay? So what they did, what went into the models, was actually remove that area. So we removed it and said that's what's interesting. They removed it and said, well, we're not going to plan for conservation in that area because we don't know for a fact that the species occurs there. They did that in a, in a different way to, to how we actually pulled out those areas. They, they basically just drew a minimum convex polygon, convex hull around the known occurrence points. So that's this idea of basically just, uh, if you imagine taking your occurrence points and stretching an elastic band around them, it's just geographically that area that kind of fits around the points. They drew those in the GIS around the points, they actually then buffered it by, by some number of kilometers and then clipped out, removed areas that fell outside um, that, that buffering. So you see that there are some areas from um, south and 
these areas around here that, that, that were clipped out, but of course the main, the most significant areas were these areas up north that were, were removed from the ditch. And again, going back to these, these diagrams, um, going back to the theory that we started with, they were therefore trying to pull out these predictions and say, well, we're not going to conservation plan for these because we don't know whether or not the species occurs there. They were basically trying to build a distribution model that fits around the known occurrence points and just gives us more information than the known occurrence points themselves. Again, this, this was just this idea of saying, well, well let's, you know, let's try and do better than we can just by, by drawing, if you like, a, a convex hull or, or something around the occurrence points. This was, as I said, one of the earliest applications really of these, these niche models or these distribution models was to simply say, can we kind of do better than what's done in the field regards? Instead of just taking these occurrence points and saying, well, roughly, uh, you know, species occupies this area, can we use the model to identify the suitable habitat so it's, it's informed by which areas are, 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 most, are most environmentally suitable? But in effect, it's, a, it's kind of interpolating around the known occurrence points. So they weren't interested in these areas of what some folks have termed over-prediction. But are they really over-prediction as a neg in a negative sense, in terms of, oh, the model's failed because it's predicted these areas where the species isn't known to occur? Well, we've given you some examples now, and there's more to come, invasive species, species discovery, where these are the areas of interest. But from this conservation plan application, this was the area of interest, so they removed those. Are you with me? So this is, uh, yeah, last, last slide. Again, this is the kind of headline result from that study. Once they built the distribution models for 2,315 species or so, um, uh, I should emphasize that not all of those they could actually build distribution models for. Some of them simply didn't have enough points to do so. But, 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 um, but, but for many of them, they used distribution models. And then what you're seeing is, it, uh, the parts in yellow from, from 2002, the protected areas in blue um, that had been added by, by um, 2006, and then these areas in red are what the models are saying uh, in combination with the distribution models combined with the, the, the reserve planning algorithm that says these are the areas where we, we suggest that they should be priorities for, based on the information we have, which is imperfect, but those are the areas where you're going to get, if you like, like most bang for your buck. You, very US term, but you're going to get most of the best results for a certain investment of capital in terms of the, the money, the time, and, and, and importantly, the land area um, for, for, for conservation. So, this was a, you know, a, an academic paper that was put out as, a, as an exercise for, for, for showing how we could use these combinations, this suite of, of GIS tools and databases, distribution models, reserve planning algorithms um, to, to, to build these kind of um, uh, uh, prioritization um, studies. It was emphasized, and I don't want to do so that, uh, as I already kind of have done, but you know, this is only part of the picture. This was a recommendation. The whole goal, really, beyond it being an academic exercise, is for this to land on a table within the planning process that says, yeah, okay, so this doesn't take into account indigenous peoples, this doesn't take into account many of the economic interests in terms of you know, priorities for, for, for resource extraction and these kinds of things. But based on the biology, based on the biogeography, based on the known occurrence records of species, these are what we think are the most important areas for conservation. Okay?